If you've played tabletop games before, you would know that they give us something no video game or book can. Books can create a fantastic world and tell a beautiful story within, but they always read out the same. Video games can, and often do, create the illusion of free choice, but in reality, they are limited to the options their creators design. But tabletop RPGs, on the other hand, are limited only by our imagination. If you can think about it, you can try it within the game. That freedom shapes the experience and creates a living, responsive world. As game masters, we constantly react to our players. We attempt to give meaning to their choices, to show them the world is dynamic. But how? How can we grant meaning to their choices? We do that by creating consequences for their actions. Well, I guess we're done here. Wrap it up guys, I'm going to the beach. Hi there, I'm Aviatal. You could argue that everything that happens during a game session is simply consequences. And you would be right, if we look at the game with no context, it's just a bunch of people telling a referee what they want to do or where they want to go. And then the referee tells them what happens as a result. That series of cause and effect continues until they manage to slay the invisible animator table or die trying. It's pretty straightforward and simplistic, but not entirely accurate, because the context changes everything. Context, in this case, would be the sum of all the circumstances that led to this point in our story. If the party walks into a dark alley and encounters a gang of thugs, that's one thing, but if the party killed a member of the same gang in a previous session, that's quite another. The context makes a difference and adds depth to the scene. Would this encounter even happen if they not killed that thug? Maybe. Maybe not. The players realize that their actions and choices in the previous sessions may have influenced what is currently happening in the game. The gang isn't there to rob them. It's there because they want revenge. I have to believe in a world outside my own mind. I have to believe that my actions still have meaning, even if I can't remember them. I have to believe that when my eyes are closed, the world's still there. Ah, what a wonderful movie. I'll talk more about context and present a new game mechanic that could increase the presence of consequences in your game, whether it's D&D or otherwise. But before we do all that, I'll announce the winner of the city building contest. If you don't care about any of that stuff and just want to hear me talk about consequences, you can jump over to this timestamp. Using the settlements video, each of the participants created their own fantasy city for a chance to win more than Canaan's Tome of Foes. We had a number of creative and original entries for this contest, and after a long day of contemplation, I've narrowed it down to the best two. It took me another couple of hours to choose between them, because they were both wonderful and incredibly inspiring. You know a city is well designed when you get a couple of adventure ideas just by reading it. But I have only one copy of Morden Canaan's Tome of Foes to send out, so I had to choose one over the other. But then it hit me. This is my contest, I can do whatever I want. So we'll have a reward for the second place as well. So the second place goes to... Jeremy E for his city Mutwen. <laughs> Mutwen is a halfling city built on top of ancient Yuan Ti ruins. It's a unique settlement with an interesting swamp aesthetic. The wide canals along with the waddle and daub construction created the clear image in my head. It's an interesting place that I would love to explore. Thank you, Jeremy. The first place of this contest goes to Shy Offer for his city, Chariot. <laughs> Chariot began as a military outpost, but once the war subsided, it became a border city and a unique mishmash of two cultures. What I loved most about this entry is how detailed it got using only a single page. We have two rivaling factions, a couple of characters and a conspiracy brewing underneath it all. Thank you, Shy. I'll contact the winners shortly and we'll arrange a delivery of their rewards. If you're interested in reading their entries, I'll link both of them in the description, so make sure you check them out once you finish watching this video. Anyway, back to the main subject. We've established that context is an important factor when considering the consequences. Without context, everything feels random, which is the exact opposite of the consistent world we are trying to portray. Mind you, random things can happen in realistic worlds, Sometimes it makes sense to pull out a random duck from our toolbox and throw it into the scene. But if we use it too often, the world will lose credibility. 
will throw off the player's suspense of disbelief and end up with a bath full of ducks that nobody ever gets to play with. And that's very sad. So to account for consequences in the game, to mark certain actions or choices the party makes for future use as context. Some examples are obvious. If the party chose to spare a foe, we could have him return later in the campaign to either help or hinder the party. In fact, the players will probably expect that to happen, and why shouldn't they? It's almost too good not to use. Whenever I find myself thinking, this will have consequences during a game session, I take note. After the session is over, I review these notes and see if they still make sense. If we go back to the thugs example from earlier, it requires the party to stay in the city. But if they plane shifted to the other side of the continent, well it doesn't make a lot of sense if the same thugs appear there, right? Maybe if the party returns to the city a while later, they could run into the same thugs, but who knows how long will that take, it might be irrelevant by then. Just because we had an idea for a possible consequence doesn't mean we'll end up using it. Even if the circumstances allow it, we might decide it's not worth it. When in doubt, I simply ask, will this make a good story? The answer will determine whether I use it or not. I'll also consider some of the previous consequences the party experienced. If the party got a lot of negative feedback for their actions recently, I'll think twice before throwing yet another setback their way. Look, I'm not saying you have to keep the balance, but if you can think of an example for a positive consequence of your party's actions, then you're probably being a little harsh on those poor XP junkie murder hobos. I mean, they really do deserve it for hitting everyone in their path, but they can at least receive a job offer from your local evil overlord. Good minions are hard to come by. Speaking of evil overlords, sometimes the consequences of the party's actions can be translated to changes in the factions of our setting. Remember the faction sheet? So I've made one for a crime organization in a campaign I run. They are called the Scarred, and the party really did a number on them. They completely eradicated one of the sects, uncovered a large smuggling operation of another, and basically robbed them. This was a big hit to their power and resources, which made Auxilium an enemy of the Scarred. The players know I will eventually bring it back to bite their ass, but in the meantime, crime rates have dropped significantly and the city really appreciates that. I wanted a way to make it more apparent, so with the help of some friends I've devised a new meta mechanic that you can bring into your home games. I call this one Status. Status is a special condition that is handed to the party after they accomplish something that the GM deems meaningful. The status can then be used by the players once per game session to gain a benefit, which can range anywhere from gaining information to gaining actual favors. Each status has a level ranging between minus 5 to 5. A status with a positive level can be used by the players, while a negative status can only be activated by the GM. We'll cover how they do that shortly, but first let's talk about the kinds of status there are. There are two types of status. Faction favor, as the name implies, is directly connected to a faction within the setting, and has very little relevance otherwise. It is usually granted after the party interacted with a faction in some way. If the party did a good deed and requested no payment in exchange, they might receive a level 2 faction favor with the Order of Flight. On the other hand, if the party killed a few thugs, they might receive a level negative 2 faction favor with the Scarred. The second type of status is called Renown which tends to be more broad than faction thing. An example of renown could be protectors of the city, which could be a level 3 renown. A positive status can be used to gain a benefit. You can think of it like a shortcut. The players, not the characters, decide to use their status and tell the GM what they are trying to achieve. If the scope of the request aligns with the level of the status and seems reasonable to the GM, they will narrate how the party uses their status to surpass the challenge, no roles required. On the screen you will find a few examples of some benefits the party can gain by activating a faction favor or renown of a different level. The level of the status is not reduced when you activate it, but it can be altered otherwise. Fame only lasts for so long, so the GM might decide that after a while the status loses a level. On the other hand, if the party continues to do good deeds, they might gain more levels with the Order of Light, unlocking new possibilities. Faction favors can be used in a different way. The party can decide to burn the faction favor and receive an even greater benefit. This could be magical items, followers in battle, or access to travel across planes. 
Of course, the scale of the possible benefit depends on the current level of the status and the abilities of the faction. Once a status is burned, its level reduces by 1. On the screen you will find a few examples for benefits for burning faction favor, depending on the level of the status. A negative status can be used by the GM to add a complication against the player characters. Here are a few ideas for the GM to use negative renown or faction favor. Like with positive faction favor, the GM can choose to burn negative faction favor to invoke something truly nasty. And by doing so, increase the level of the status a notch closer to zero to indicate their feud is now a little closer to being settled. Here are a few ideas for burning negative faction favor. Exactly like positive status, negative status can be altered by the player actions or change with time. If the party decided to get out of town for a while, they might come back and realize the guild is no longer out to get them. When designing game mechanics, we should keep their purpose in mind. It's easy to get lost in the creative process, in fact that's actually half the fun, but when we're done building we should look at it from an objective viewpoint and ask, is it still doing what I originally intended it to? Is it also doing something else? The status mechanic was built with the intention of making consequences more apparent to the players, and inspired GMs to create future consequences. I feel like it's doing both with positive and negative status respectively. I think this mechanic will not be overwhelming, because at most each status will be used once per session. One side effect that I thought about is that status could theoretically give the players information their characters would not otherwise have. Maybe I want to keep the enmity of the Assassin's Guild a secret so the players won't metagame and be paranoid about everything. It's possible to create a status without revealing it to the players until the moment it's used against them. And for some extreme examples, that is a good solution. But I'd argue that in most cases, the party will at least have an intuition that someone is out to get them. And that's another thing this mechanic does well. It helps bridge the gap that is character intuition. The characters are a part of the world, and they possess knowledge that the players do not. That's why we use knowledge skill checks to determine if our characters know something. There's no way we would know everything they would. Shouldn't this be true for intuition as well? You can find a link to the mechanic in the description. This mechanic is still in test play and I haven't tinkered with it that much. But if you end up using it, let me know how it worked out in the comments. I'm also interested to hear about ideas you have to improve this mechanic, or new ways to use status. If you like this video, hit the like button and subscribe for more videos like this one in the future. If you want to chat about nerdy tabletop stuff, you can find me on the channel's discord, I'll put a link in the description as well. Until next time, you are awesome, keep being awesome, and I'll see you beyond the screen.